Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining Flexport's inaugural webinar series. And what will be a series is intended to uncover secrets and tips to help you continually take back more of your supply chain. Your supply chain is a strategic tool that can help your company differentiate from competition, as well as gain and sustain competitive advantage. We're here to help you realize that advantage. My name is Trey Clausen, and I'm the Director of Customer Solutions based in Flexport's newly minted Atlanta office right in the heart of Midtown Atlanta. Prior to joining Flexport, I served in various operations and account management roles within Kununagal and Panalpina. My experience has been mostly focused on working with clients like you to help design, implement, and manage their supply chain strategies. One of the things that really drew me into Flexport was how deeply Flexport cares about putting customers and their priorities first. So we're really excited with the feedback that we've had for this particular webinar. Uh, we've had over 150 registrants with a great mix of shippers and Im importers, along with competition too. Uh, and looking through the list, I even recognize some of the names from my old home at Kununagal. Thanks again for joining. To make sure you've landed in the right place, this first installment in the webinar series will illuminate the hidden secrets regarding international FCL transit times, and it will help provide you some action, actionable tools for you to take back to your organization. The presentation will consist of approximately 30 minutes of presentation and then 30 minutes of Q&A at the end. If you have questions throughout the presentation, please be sure to include them in the Q&A section of your screen. I will try to get to as many of these questions as possible after the, the webinar. And of course, if you have questions afterwards, please feel free to reach out to any with, anyone within Flexport and we'll make sure to give you an answer. Now for the part that you've been waiting for, the hidden insights into the sea freight transportation process specifically related to transit times. As you'll hopefully see, a major reason why there's a cloak of darkness in the process is because in most cases, your forwarder's incentives are not aligned with your own. Forwarders tend to maximize short run profitability, carrier allocations, and, and more things in lieu of your long run satisfaction and success. At first, we'll look at carriers uh, and how they are strictly not on time. C-Intel is a leading sea freight market intelligence provider and they publish Steamship Line on time performance on a monthly basis. You may have already guessed that Steamship Lines perform really poorly, but the very best performing Steamship Line has an 80% schedule adherence or on time performance. This carrier is Wan He, which is a niche provider based in Taiwan. The carriers that you're most accustomed to using, like Maersk, CMA, MSC, Costco, Hapag Lloyd, etc., hover between 65 and 75 percent. The most jarring piece in all of this information is that this on-time performance already includes two days of buffer as provided by C-Intel. That means that if the vessel is scheduled to arrive on a Tuesday, but it arrives on a Thursday instead, then C-Intel still considers this on time. So who knows how poorly the steamship lines would perform if the data was actually considered based on the announced schedules that the carriers provide. Next, we see that transit times that your forwarders give to you are not door to door. If your freight forwarder gives you transit times associated with a quote or a response to an RFQ, these transit times are strictly port to port and They've been based on wildly inaccurate steamship line schedules that we just mentioned. In most cases, the forwarder will not explicitly tell you that these transit times are port to port. You either have to know that this is the case or ask your forwarder the clarifying question. Of course, regardless of who's paying for the different legs of the transport process, your cargo isn't useful if it just moves from port to port, so it obviously has to move from door to door. Therefore, when you're making your buying and inventory calculations, pay very close attention to this detail. When your forwarder provides you with a quote, it's highly likely that they will base the quote on multiple steamship lines across the various alliances to ensure that they can have volume coverage for your shipments. This is good news for you because you'll have access to multiple sailings. However, these multiple steamship lines will have different routes that they take to get you from point A to point B. So if, if you're moving cargo from Yantian to Chicago, Maersk will have a different route than Hapag Lloyd, and Hapag Lloyd will have a different route than CMA, 
This means that the transit time that your forwarder provides in your quote is based on a blend or average of multiple steamship lines with highly varying transit times. These three different carriers will possibly take three, four, five different possible routings in order to get from uh, Yantian to Chicago. At the risk of beating a dead horse, this means that the already inaccurate transit times become even more inaccurate once they're blended together. So they're basically rendered useless as a planning tool at this point. When providing transit times, freight forwarders provide the absolute best case scenario, as if everything in the world lines up perfectly, as opposed to the likely scenario that's backed by historically verified data. If you spent more than a couple of weeks in logistics, you definitely know that the best case scenario is not a likely result in transportation. It's very typical for plans B and C to be utilized. So if that's what we experience in reality, why shouldn't we already plan for the most likely situation? And finally, we arrive at the last point. Uh, if you've ever been to the beach in the fall or winter time, you've probably noticed that the ocean is much rougher and choppier than it is when you're there during, the, during your summer vacation. This is even more magnified in the middle of the ocean, as you would expect. Because of this, it would make sense that the schedules that steamship lines provide reflect the changes in weather patterns throughout the year. However, steamship lines report the same schedules and tra transit times year round without any changes based on seasonality. It's very typical that vessels have to take different routes or slow down their engines at the very least to keep their crew and cargo safe in the transport process. So again, to drive the point home here, the already inaccurate schedules become even worse in the fall and winter months. Okay, so I think you get the point at this, at this point. Uh, transit times really suck. So I'm sure that you all have had your own bad experiences as the result of basing a decision off of a faulty transit time. But I wanted to highlight a really extreme example of how quickly one wrong decision can have deleterious impacts on your business. This is a true case example that happened to me at the beginning of my career when I was with Panalpina. The customer in question was an automotive supplier to a German car manufacturer. They had weekly arrivals, uh, weekly buyer's consolidations that arrived every Thursday into the Port of Charleston to replenish that week's inventory. Uh, the arrivals were scheduled for Thursday before they ran completely out of inventory on Friday as they're an automotive supplier, so they were trying to run a very, very lean supply chain. I just, as I just mentioned, during the winter months, the schedules become extended because of the really choppy seas, the bad weather, all these different things. Uh, so the vessel was unfortunately delayed from an arrival on Thursday until an arrival on Saturday due to this inclement weather. Because the auto manufacturer, of course, every Friday was, was planning to run out of inventory, the lack of inventory would cause the car manufacturer's production line to shut down. And then in turn, it would cause the uh, German car manufacturer's production line to shut down. The penalty for these types of production shutdowns was an egregious sum of $50,000 for every five minutes. So if you do the math for an entire day's worth of production, if, if that's what the supplier is causing to shut down, it could be upwards of $60 million that the customer has to pay or that the supplier has to pay uh, in, in penalties. To make matters even worse, this delay coincided with the end of the supplier's fiscal year. The supplier planned to completely deplete their inventory after this container arrived and had zero safety stock for production that week. So as they weighed the, the cost and benefits of various different decisions that they had at their disposal, the supplier was forced to air freight the inventory. Because this was already at the end of the week, uh, there are no flights that could accommodate this 100 tons of capacity overnight, so they had to in turn schedule and secure a 747 air freight charter from Europe to the US, which depending on the time of the year, costs approximately half a million dollars to secure. The key point in, in all of this, besides the fact that the supplier had to outlay half a million dollars in air freight costs, is that the forwarder profited from this error. The forwarder's incentives are not aligned with, with you as the client, 
Uh, express shipments are more lucrative, so the forwarder has little incentive to avoid these types of delays. Obviously, there's a significant cost and bur burden shouldered by you in the event of these transit time errors. Every time that decisions are based on this faulty information, you have to uh, take the burden of these various different costs. As a result, you're left with, unfortunately, three truly crappy choices. First, if the transit time cannot be trusted, then a logical step is to carry excess inventory to protect against stockouts, production lines shutting down, or having to pay for expensive expedites. Obviously, there are costs to carrying excess inventory. It shows up on your balance sheet, you have to pay the physical warehouse space to store all of the material, and there's greater opportunity for inventory to be damaged or misplaced. Second, as you weigh the cost benefit of carrying excess inventory, you can choose instead to pay for costly expedites in the form of expedited truck deliveries, air freight, or worse, uh, onboard couriers and air freight charters. All of these various different types of expedites are their own four letter word to a shipper, but can be really crippling to some businesses. In the manufacturing world, most suppliers and OEMs typically plan for about 10 to 15% of their freight spend to be tied up in these types of emergencies. However, this obviously is an extremely expensive price to pay for a lean supply. Finally, if you don't choose either of these previous crappy options, you're left with the choice of missed deliveries to customers, production lines shutting down, stockouts, etc. There are obviously other costs that, uh, that don't show up. Uh, so not to mention the indirect costs, which don't show up right away on any report, but may end up being even costlier in the, in the long run. There are tar tarnished customer relationships that are based on trust and service level performance, a tarnished reputation, whether that's to a customer or internally to vendors, an opportunity cost of lost sales. And then finally, there is the individual cost of employee termination. Uh, in the example that I just mentioned in the previous slide, Unfortunately, the employee that was responsible for this error lost their job at the, at the, the result of the, the major crisis. The wonderful news for you is that the world doesn't have to end there, and you no longer have to fall into either of those categories above. You've tuned in this webinar, and we will arm you with various levers that you can pull in each phase of the transportation process to take back control of your supply chain. Even more importantly, we will help you evaluate your freight forwarder and enable you to ask the right questions of your forwarder. As, men as mentioned earlier, the forwarder's incentives are not necessarily aligned with your own, so it's important that you ask yourself the question at each stage, how is the forwarder incentivized in this stage and how does that differ from what my incentives are as well? So first, we will look at the origin process. To begin, as we mentioned earlier, forwarders and carriers are making decisions based on maximizing their own allocations and contracts with steamship lines. This could potentially mean that the quote that you receive is only for one steamship line or alliance. It doesn't have to be this way, though, as it's per perfectly reasonable for you to ask for sailings that are optimal for your business needs and that they are across multiple carriers, alliances, and sailing days. This helps you avoid potential missed sailings and last minute price hikes that are typical on really volatile trade lines, like from the Trans-Pacific uh, trade to the West Coast in the United States. As a side point, not only do the forwarders want to maximize their own contracts, but they also benefit from the last minute scramble that often happens when a sailing is missed. So when, they, when you have to expedite a truck or expedite a booking, the forwarder in most cases is making a significantly higher profit than they would if the shipment just uh, transpired as planned. The next tip here is that if your business allows for it, it's imperative that you're consistent with fulfilling your requested bookings. We know that as an industry standard, upwards of 25% of bookings are canceled on a weekly basis. 
Despite what it may look like at times, the carriers aren't stupid and are well aware of this trend. So they plan for this each week by overbooking vessels. So that's a big reason why if your containers get rolled each week, uh, a, a big reason for that is that the vessels are overbooked and so they have to roll some cargo to accommodate the cargo that shows up. One of the ways that you can combat this is by consistently showing up each week when you make bookings. The carriers will then learn about your good behavior and they'll reward you with actually giving you the space that you booked each week. Two other really important, important points here are that first, the carriers attribute the bookings to the forwarder first and then the customer. So if you're spreading your bookings across multiple forwarders, the carriers will recognize that, that as independent volume and your good behavior will be diluted across those multiple forwarders. So when you need space during peak season, if you're using different forwarders, the carriers will only recognize the small amount of volume that, do, that you do with each forwarder. Second, forecasts, and even more importantly, accurate forecasts, enable your forwarder to book shipments in advance and secure space for you. This is important throughout the course of the entire year, but it becomes especially important during peak season. And lastly, we turn to the last bit of advice on the origin side. Uh, to avoid the last minute scramble before shipment departs, be sure to prepare as much as you can in advance. Your forwarder should be providing you with all relevant dates and timestamps for your cargo to move, but, uh, oh, so, sorry, uh, your forwarder should be providing all of these relevant dates and timestamps for your cargo to move, like the document cutoffs, port cutoffs, shipper's instructions, VGM, and ISF if it's applicable. Uh, all of these dates have direct bearing on whether or not the shipments will actually move, not just the day that the cargo arrives at the port. So if your forwarder doesn't provide you this information, make sure that you ask so that you can hit the marks accordingly. It's really key to point out here that the date that the cargo arrives at the port is important, but all the other facets of the transportation process are extremely important as well. Now we will turn our attention to the actual transit process. There are several actions that you can take here to have more control over your supply chain and the actual transportation process. The first one that we'll look at is factoring in loading and unloading times. As I mentioned earlier, steamship lines and forwarders plan for the very best case scenario when providing the shipment schedule. However, we often find out that the best case scenario is not the likeliest case. In the instance of rail transit times, steamship lines don't plan for any time between when the container is offloaded from the vessel and transferred for the, to the rail. In the example that you see on the slide here, you can see that the carrier is planning for the container to be off the vessel on July 15th and then departing the, on the rail the very next day. Uh, this has no bearing on reality as it's not realistic for a container to be offloaded on a Saturday uh, or excuse me, for a, a vessel to arrive on a Saturday, the container to be offloaded within the same day, and then the container to be on the rail the very next day. More realistically, uh, the container will take a couple days to be offloaded, and then another day or two to move from the container yard terminal to the, the rail yard. So again, this has no bearing on reality, so it's crucial that you're made aware of this transportation plan glitch. So when you see rail included, make sure that you understand that this isn't what really is happening. And next in the trans transit process, uh, we would love for you to optimize your routing. Um, when you're working with your forwarder, it's very appropriate to ask questions they will give you a service, as I mentioned earlier, that maximizes their allocations and their contracts. So it's really important that you understand what your business needs are and communicate those as best you can to the forwarder. And they should be providing you with a sailing and routing that, sh that will match your business needs. It's really important that you ask for the steamship lines and the slings that your freight forwarder is planning to use on the services they provide to you. If you're if a direct service is available, ask for that. It will, in some cases, be more expensive, but it's really important that if you want a fast transit time uh, that you use this direct service. 
Now, most of you are probably shipping from Asia to the US. And in these cases, you can consider the cost benefit of using the West Coast versus the US East Coast. Most shippers choose the US West Coast because it's, uh, it's cheaper and oftentimes the scheduled transit time looks to be faster than using the US East Coast. However, an all water service to the US East Coast is a much, much, much more consistent service. Uh, if the schedule reports that the service should be 30 days, in most cases, the carriers get somewhere between 29 and 32 days. However, if you use the US West Coast coming in via LA, Oakland, Seattle, or the West Coast of Canada, the shipment has to be transited on the rail to the, the East Coast. And in this case, the rail process is extremely variable. It's also important that you understand the ports of call on the string, and, and if possible, use the last port out, first port in pairings. It's crucial that you know the transshipment points. Um, if, the, if it's a very slow service, uh, it's highly likely that the carrier will use transshipment points. And so those are uh, really large opportunities for delays in the transit process. If you miss a transship, then your shipment will be delayed for upwards of a week, or in some cases, two weeks, until it hits the next ship. Also, with the last port out, first port in pairings, if you're looking at uh, Shanghai to LA, or if you are moving cargo uh, on, the, on transatlantic lanes, you could, look, you could look at the last port out of, um, out of Europe, which is typically Rotterdam, Bremerhaven, or Antwerp, and the first port into the US East Coast, which is usually New York, Norf Norfolk, Charleston, or Savannah. In these cases, the, transit, the total transit time is much less variable. It may be a little bit more expensive, but if you are looking for consistency and in a fast transit, these are really great options for you. And obviously, uh, it's, it's very important that we point out that the cheapest routing typically requires some level of trade-off. There is, it's usually a longer transit time, more transshipment points, uh, and all of this leads to more variability. However, if you have a more expensive service, then the opposite is true. So it'll be typically a shorter transit time, direct service, and more consistency, hopefully, in your transit process. Also, when you're requesting quotes from your forwarder, uh, ask for multiple service levels. So something that has a shorter transit time um, that is more expensive and something that has a longer transit time that is potentially cheaper so that you can be in control of the decision-making process in your supply chain as opposed to the forwarder making the choice for you. In every instance where a forwarder is making the choice for you, they will choose whatever service maximizes their allocations and their contracts, which is typically, as I mentioned earlier, not, not what is best for you as the importer. Now, finally, we will turn our attention to the levers that you can pull at the destination process. First, it's really crucial that you get your cargo pre-released. So this includes your customs entry. Uh, now with the ACE portal, you can file your customs entry or your forwarder can file your customs entry as soon as the cargo is manifested um, at origin. Customs won't recognize the customs clearance until it's about five days prior to the vessel's arrival. But if you submit the clearance as soon as the, the cargo is manifested, then you can know ahead of time if there are any issues with the clearance, such as x-ray exams, documentation requests, uh, or things like that. Also, it's really important that you settle everything with your supplier so that they're still not holding on to the original bill of lading. So this includes uh, payment to your supplier. The, if you are shipping goods on an original bill of lading, that means that your supplier has title of that of that cargo until you've settled all the charges on the bill of lading. So if the original bill of lading is misplaced or it's not satisfied in full, then the supplier can hold on to your cargo once it arrives at the destination. Along the lines of the, the previous point, uh, we suggest that you, if, if, if you're able to, separate your credit terms from the title to the cargo by using uh, express seaway bills. This means that you will have credit with your suppliers, 
and your payment to them does not uh, allow the supplier to hold cargo once it arrives in the U.S. And last but not least, with regards to the destination process, um, this is a really, really key tidbit, tidbit that not a lot of uh, importers are aware of, um, but it's important that if you're using a rail service that you are actually able to get on the train. Uh, so one, one of the questions that you can ask is, you can find out whether your carrier's terminal has on-dock rail. On-dock rail means that the rail yard is connected to the container terminal. So when a container is offloaded from a vessel, um, it can move immediately from the container yard to the rail. If, they, if that carrier does not have on-dock rail at the terminal, then the container will have to be transitioned from the container yard via a truck over to the rail yard. So that typically takes upwards of uh, two to three days. If you're looking at cargo in LA, uh, it could take three to four days for the container to be offloaded from the vessel because these vessels are so large. And then it could take another two to three days for the container to be transitioned from the container yard to the rail. So if you are trying to move your shipments as quickly as possible, that could add an additional week in your entire transit process that, as we mentioned before, uh, was not in the original schedule. And then the final point here is that though 40-foot containers are typically a little bit more expensive than 20-foot containers, uh, it's best to utilize 40-foot containers when utilizing a rail service because with 20-foot containers, you have to have a paired 20-foot container. So a second 20-foot container that travels along with, the, uh, with your 20-foot container to actually move it on rail. So I've seen in some cases where a container has sat for over a week waiting for a paired 20-foot container to move on the rail. So again, if you are okay with a high, highly variable transit, um, then it's fine to use these 20-foot containers. But if you need a really sharp, quick transit time, uh, it's, it's best to try to use these 40-foot containers instead. So that concludes the content of the presentation. Thank you so much for your time and attention during the webinar. I hope that it's been inform informative and entertaining, and more importantly, I hope that you've gotten value out of the information that we've covered. As we've co covered a lot of material, I'm going to open up the Q&A portion of the webinar and of course, if we're not able to get to your questions, or if you find that you have other questions later on, uh, please feel free to reach out to us uh, later on in, uh, after the webinar is over. So I will look at the questions and I will do my best to answer as many as possible. And of course, if you have questions throughout the process uh, as I'm talking, uh, please feel free to use the Q&A section um, to include a question. Okay, so the first question is, how can I find out the on-time performance of my carrier? And a follow-up there is, how can I find a better alternative? So I mentioned at the very beginning, uh, the service C-Intel. If you go to cintel.com, they have a monthly published analysis of carrier on-time performance. Um, you can either pay for the monthly subscription or you can get a free preview of each month's publication. This will give a full overview of, I believe is the top 25 carriers and their on-time performance. And a way to find a better alternative is uh, to work alongside with your freight forwarder to, un to help them understand what you need in the supply chain process. And then hopefully you can find a carrier together um, that will help satisfy the needs or um, you can, of course, make suggestions to your forwarder. If you see that Maersk performs really well on a certain trade lane, um, then you can certainly suggest that to your forwarder that, that you want to use Maersk. Um, as I mentioned earlier, of course, if a carrier is typically more consistent, um, if, if uh, the, the carrier is more consistent, then it'll typically be more expensive. The second question is, uh, will penalties and forwarder agreements drive better performance? So I think this question uh, goes towards 
the cancellations. Um, and if you've asked this question, if, if this isn't correct, then, then please let me know. Um, but right now in the industry, if a container is booked and does not show up, there is no penalty to the forwarder or the customer uh, for that. Um, there are other industries uh, like the, the trucking and air freight industry. If your shipment does not show up, then you typically have to pay either the full transportation cost or some type of dead freight cost that is a, a percentage of whatever the, the cost was. Um, so from, from my perspective, yes, I, I think that the penalties uh, can, can definitely drive better performance here um, from the, the steamship lines uh, if, if they penalize forwarders and if they penalize customers. Uh, but then also on the other side, if there are penalties written into contracts, um, if you're settling KPIs with your freight forwarder and you're setting, setting the expectations, if you are, for example, wanting 95% on-time performance, it's really crucial that you understand, along with your forwarder, um, what the historical performance has been. And then you can institute some level of, of penalties into the agreement that enables the forwarder to, um, uh, to, to choose better options. In that case, their, um, their, their performance will, will really be driven by not being penalized. Um, and again, with, with the, the, the website, it's cintel, S-E-A-I-N-T-E-L.com. We have another question here that, uh, why does shorter tran transit time mean higher price? Is there any fundamental difference uh, in such as prioritizing shipments? So the, the shorter transit times uh, typically are higher price because they include uh, fewer transshipment points. Um, it's, it's typically like a, a direct service. Um, it's usually like a, a last port in, first port out. So there's, there's higher demand overall. Um, and then there's just, excuse me, a higher demand from the customer base, from the forwarders and the, and the customers, um, which, which typically drives the, uh, the price up. And so as the supply goes down, then the, the price typically goes up. So it's not uh, a rule that a shorter transit time means a higher price, but that's usually what we see in practice. Uh, we have a question here that says, how much can seasonality affect transit times? Um, in looking at the transatlantic transit uh, cargo lanes from Europe to the US, it usually impacts the transit by anywhere from two to five days. Um, but if you think about the overall transit time where it's usually 12 to 16 days, if you're adding two to five days on top of that, um, that's anywhere from 20 to 50% in addition to what the, the transit time process is. So in looking at the, the Trans-Pacific lanes, um, the, the winter and fall months don't have as significant of an impact um, but we're looking at um, more like uh, typhoon season uh, and various other weather, weather patterns like that in Asia. Um, so it usually adds several days on top of the, on top of the schedule. Uh, and as I mentioned, um, it would make sense for the carriers to include these delays and these uh, historical expectations on top of the transit times, um, but unfortunately they don't include those in the schedules. The next question is, uh, what is the minimum amount of information my forecast should include in order to be genuinely helpful to my forwarder? Um, so the, the best forecast that you can provide is uh, the number of containers, the container type, the commodity, the weight, and the expected transit time process. However, if you're not able to include all this information, at the very least, uh, it's best to provide the number of containers, the container types, and when the cargo will be ready. Again, the, the forecasts are extremely helpful, helpful to the forwarders and the carriers to be able to allocate space properly. Um, when you are experiencing 25% cancellations in, uh, from the, the, the carrier perspective, um, if they have these, these 
pre-bookings in place, they will definitely prioritize those pre-bookings as opposed to a last minute booking that, that comes, comes through. Another question is, what is the standard timeline for document cutoff dates and port cutoff dates? So typically, the document cutoff dates and the port cutoff dates are anywhere from two to four days before the planned departure. Uh, the, the port cutoff dates are usually closer to, uh, to two days, and then document cutoff dates are, um, are uh, three, uh, excuse me, two to four days. Um, so again, it's, it's really important that you understand what these cutoff times are, um, because even though the, um, even though the, the, the cargo may not have to be turned into the port until two days prior to departure, you need to have the documentation already planned out so that you can submit it to your forwarder, who can then do um, uh, the shipping instructions, the uh, VGM, and, and various things like that. Next question is, how do these transit time concepts apply to LCL freight? So LCL freight is very, very similar to the FCL freight, except for the only difference in, in what I've mentioned is that with LCL, uh, you typically have to turn in your cargo um, five to seven days prior to the vessel departure. Um, because the consolidator, either the freight forwarder or the consolidator, has to consolidate the shipments uh, and, and load them into an FCL container and then bring them to the port. So when you're looking at your transit times for LCL, it's usually best to add anywhere from 10 days to two weeks on top of what the FCL transit process looks like. Next question here is, if we want to transition to a different freight forwarder, do you think it's a good idea to initiate that transition during peak season? Will it really affect space on vessels and transit times? Uh, so my opinion here is um, that you can, you can transition at any point to a different freight forwarder. Um, however, it's, it becomes a little bit more challenging during peak season to make these transitions unless that forwarder is able to give some reasonable expectation of securing space. Um, so if you're moving significant volume uh, consistently, um, then the carriers understand and know that you're, that you're moving that volume consistently. However, if your volume peaks during peak season, which implies that the peak season, um, then, then the transition becomes a little bit more challenging because there's not that uh, historic um, precedence of, of having cargo moving with that forwarder. That doesn't mean that that it's not uh, possible. We, we see all the time that customers move over to us during peak season um, uh, so, that, um, so that they can get space on the, on the vessel. So uh, larger freight forwarders typically are going to prioritize their largest customers, which means that smaller and medium-sized customers are typically the ones that are rolled if a decision has to be made to be rolled. Uh, so to a smaller freight forwarder, um, this cargo is much, much more important, and so there's a higher likelihood of that forwarder being able to secure space. The next question is, is the FOB Ingo term always the best one for me as a customer? So from, from my opinion, collect Ingo terms are typically the best for uh, the, the total supply chain because it allows you to have more control over, um, over the entire supply chain process. It means that you're allowed to choose the freight forwarder, you're able to choose the routing, and you um, have theoretically complete control over what's going on in the process. Um, the FOB Ingo term is historically used out of Asia, um, and that, that's typically used because the, the larger forwarders that are not based in Asia um, have different compliance requirements that don't allow them to uh, utilize some of the lower cost carriers uh, in, in China um, or, or throughout Asia. The, the local Asian uh, forwarders are able to use, in some cases, uh, the, these smaller uh, providers. Uh, if, if you just Google uh, truckers in, in China, you can see some, some interesting things uh, transpire. Um, but, but the FOB Incoterm 
just typically um, takes away the headache and the high cost uh, within China. Um, however, uh, Flexport is, is um, working extensively right now to partner with carriers in China um, so that the XWorks Incoterm becomes an effective tool that, um, that customers can use. If you're looking at cargo moving out of, out of Europe and um, South America, and in some cases Africa, the XWorks Incoterm is an effective Incoterm to use as well um, because you take control over the cargo as soon as it, um, sorry, the, the, the shipper has the responsibility to make the cargo available to whichever carrier, carrier you nominate in that country. Um, so it gives you absolute control over the entire process and it gives you more leverage over your supplier as well. If you're getting cargo, if you're receiving cargo on uh, prepaid Inco terms, it means that um, you're not making any of the decisions in the transportation process. And so therefore the, the cargo um, shows up when it shows up. And in most cases, the shipper will be adding a margin on top of whatever the cost for the transportation is. Um, and so you're, you're paying more for a uh, typically a lower quality service. We have a, another question here. Um, it says, you mentioned going towards separating credit terms from the title of the cargo. If this is not possible, what does Flexport do to facilitate the passing of original bills? Also, will you facilitate the transfer of original commercial documents if the need arises at countries of destination? So within Flexport, we have a, uh, a wonderful um, ability within our platform to be able to, to, to handle the original bill of lading process electronically. Um, we're able to do all of this through our platform. Um, so the, the physical documentation um, should still be shipped from the shipper to the consignee. Um, but if we have the, the acknowledgement from the shipper that the bill of lading should be released, whether that's in an email um, or they send us a letter, I mean, obviously we prefer a message, um, then we are able to uh, release the goods to, to the consignee. Um, and then also the, the second part of the question, will you facilitate the transfer of original commercial documents if the need arises at countries of destination? Um, so yes, we can definitely do that. Uh, we can either include the documentation along with the cargo, um, so it can, can move physically with the cargo, uh, but then we also have the ability to uh, send the documentation uh, via courier to wherever it needs to go. So um, if you're exporting from the US into Brazil, all shipments arriving into Brazil require original commercial invoices uh, original bills of lading, um, and they all have to be signed. And so in these cases, with it, if, if it's air freight, then we include the documents with the cargo. But if it's sea freight, then we include the documents in a courier package uh, that arrives ahead of time uh, before the cargo uh, arrives at the destination. We have another question here. Um, what's the standard loading and unloading time and transfer time for vessel to rail? So I touched on this a little bit, um, but the standard loading and unloading times vary across uh, different ports. So if you're looking at the West Coast ports, um, LA, Long Beach, Oakland, Seattle, the, it typically takes a, a, a little bit longer um, than, it, on the, on the East Coast. So um, it's, the, the vessels are, are much larger. They have uh, far greater capacity than the vessels that are arriving into the East Coast. And so it takes about um, anywhere from two to four days for the, the containers to be offloaded. Um, and then the, the transfer time for, for vessel to rail. So on the, on the West Coast, again, I mentioned earlier, um, it, could, it could be upwards of a week, um, but it usually is between two and four days. If you're looking at using service on the East Coast, um, the standard loading and unloading times in Charleston, Savannah, and Norfolk are usually about one day. Um, uh, in some cases with, with Norfolk, it, it can be upwards of two days, um, but it's, it's incredibly fast. So uh, you, can, you can actually see if your container, or if the vessel arrives in the morning, your containers are typically available by that evening or worst case scenario, uh, first thing the following morning. And then the, the transfer time to the rail is usually about two days uh, on the East Coast ports. 
However, if you're utilizing uh, the Port of New York, um, then that acts more similarly to West Coast ports. It usually takes about two to four days for the containers to be offloaded. Uh, and then um, it's much more typical for containers to take between four and seven days to be transitioned from the container yard to the rail yard. Um, cargo, uh, for whatever reason, New York is, is kind of a black hole for uh, sea freight cargo and also air freight cargo in the JFK airport. The next question is, how do I find out what strings are best for a first in, last out type strategy? So one of the great resources that you can utilize, besides just asking your freight forwarder, um, is the website bigschedules.com, B-I-G-S-C-H-E-D-U-L-E-S.com. And you can type in your, uh, where the cargo is originating, and where the cargo is, uh, where the port of destination is. And it will give you all the options that are served on those two port pairs. So you can see what the longest and shorter transit times are. Uh, and you can also see if you are the, uh, if the port of loading is the last port out and if the port of destination is the first port in. Uh, again, this gives you a lot of control over the cargo because you don't have to worry about uh, the variability of containers being offloaded at different ports uh, or, or loaded onto the, the, the vessels in the port of loading. And the, the name of that website is Big Schedules, B-I-G-S-C-H-E-D-U-L-E-S.com, bigschedules.com. Um, the next question, uh, is related to Ingo terms. So I, I mentioned that, uh, or I, I answered that question effectively with a, a previous answer. Um, but again, just to, to highlight, um, so that the question is, are Ingo terms a tool I can use to control transit times? Um, so the collect Ingo terms are the best way to take control of the transit times with your Ingo terms. Um, and then the prepaid Inco terms uh, give control over to your shipper. So the shipper is, is making decisions to maximize their own profitability uh, and their own allocations with, with steamship lines. So again, the collect Inco terms are usually the best in, in controlling your, your um, transit times. Another question here is how much more should I expect to pay for a direct versus a transship? So this, this goes back to the shorter versus longer transit times. Um, so uh, it, it depends on the steamship line, but typically a direct service could be anywhere from 25 to 35% more expensive than a transship um, uh, sailing. Um, and this, this is uh, because the, the, the carrier is calling, if, it's, if the carrier is transshipping the cargo, the carrier is calling on many different ports uh, throughout the process. And it's, uh, so that they're, they're maximizing the revenue uh, through these different port calls. However, it's a, if it's a direct service, then it's a shorter transit time um, with, with not as many port calls. And so uh, it's usually, you know, like, like I mentioned, 25 to 35% more expensive. The next question is, uh, how do I find out whether my current terminal has on-dock rail? Um, so the best way to approach this is asking your forwarder directly. Um, the, the forwarder should know the answer to that question. If they do not, um, then they should definitely reach out to the steamship lines that they are using to determine if those carriers have on-dock rail. Again, these are the types of questions that um, if, you're, if your forwarder hasn't provided you with this information, um, these are the types of questions that you should feel very comfortable in asking your, your forwarder. Uh, it's information they should be sharing with you. And if they're not, it, it's not necessarily malicious intent. It's, it's in most cases innocent. Uh, they, they're, they're very busy. They're not thinking through uh, that this information is important. 
Um, and so it's, it's really crucial that you, uh, that you feel the, the comfort in asking your forward these types of questions. Okay, it looks like we have answered all of the open questions. I will allow a couple more minutes uh, for questions to pop through. Um, but as, as I'm doing that, I would like to highlight um, our next webinar in our series. Again, the, the purpose of this, this webinar series is to help uncover and illuminate um, some hidden insights that freight forwarders are taking advantage of, um, oftentimes at the expense of you, the customer. Um, and so the next title in our webinar series is Getting Ready for Peak Season. So this obviously is really important to, to, to you if you're shipping, um, especially out of Asia into into the United States. Um, but really, um, peak season is, is becoming important on transatlantic lanes as well. Uh, and the presenter for this next webinar is Narius Poshkas, who is our Vice President of Pricing and Procurement for Sea Freight. So Narius has an extensive background with Kununagal and now Flexport within Sea Freight Pricing, and he has direct access and relationships with um, all the top carriers. So this is definitely a must tune in for, for you uh, on Tuesday, July 25th. So you'll be seeing more information from Flexport about this next, um, uh, uh, th this next webinar. And um, uh, yeah, again, thank you so much for your time and interest in this webinar series. I, I hope that it's been informative to you. Uh, and that you now feel comfortable and armed with the, the, the right questions and information so that you can go back and, and talk with your forwarder about how to best serve your supply chain.